Okay. Hello. Um, hopefully, I think this is working. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, this is going to be a series kind of following up my last one. So I just did one on rhetorical analysis. And now I'm going to follow that up with this series on literary analysis. So we're going to be looking at the short story by James Joyce called Araby. Um, I love James Joyce. I think he has some issues in his writing, as many uh, writers of yesteryears do. However, his writing is so packed with symbolism and meaning that it's pretty easy to dissect. And it's so, it has a depth to it that it is well crafted and it's not accidental. Some writers, I think, kind of stumble into genius. And I really think that James Joyce kind of nails it, which is why we're going to be focusing on James Joyce. Before I even begin this, I just want to kind of talk about what actually literary analysis is. Um, so this is my own self-made chart. So bear with me as I sort of explain the flow here. So at the top, you can sort of see um, where I have the peak, the pinnacle, as it were, which is that in my belief and a lot of people's belief is that art at its most central facet is to connect to the world. So there's something about how we express our culture, our beliefs, our values is through the way that we present that. So if you watch the series on rhetorical analysis, you might um, understand this a little bit about is the rhetorical situation. And that's sort of what this is here is the literary situation. Everything that we write, poems, literature, movies, films, they have a connection to our world in the way that they express our own beliefs and values about our culture and about how that connects to other cultures and beliefs. And really, it ultimately has a purpose. It is trying to convey a message and a theme or multiple messages and themes about how we connect to the world. So that's sort of like the ultimate goal of works of art. And there's sort of things that, as you can kind of see, it's sort of like a pyramid. So the things at the bottom build up to this ultimate goal at the top of creating a theme or message. So a lot of times when we address literature, the first question that a teacher might ask you is, what's the theme? But really, you can't answer that question until you've worked your way up the pyramid. You can't get to the theme and message of a story unless you've figured out all the building blocks underneath. And this is not like a traditional pyramid in which if you, you know, think of it more of like Jenga. So if you take out certain bits, the tower still stands. And that tower is that theme and that message. So, you know, you don't have to necessarily think about all of these things for the tower to stand. However, if you take away all of them and just say, what's the theme? It, it doesn't exist, right? So the two main things that sort of build to this is what's the writer's intent? And then what's the reader's perception? So those are two different things. And you can kind of argue here that once the writer writes it, they kind of just shove it into the world. And really what the um, reader perceives is therefore gonna be vastly different and more complex than what the author would originally intend. And that might be true. But for our purposes, as we're kind of thinking is that every time we're looking at one of these different things, whether it's setting or point of view or things like that, is that the author might've had an intention and that's important to think about, but also how we perceive it might be important as well. And in AP, when we talk about complexity, that's what we mean. What we mean. Is there something different between the intent and the perception that provides a multitude of understandings when you're thinking about a piece? So you want that complexity. You want more than one reading. You want to maybe disagree with the intent or think that there's more than one perception. That's what you want. So um, you might see that the, sort of this layer down at the very bottom is not really connected. And that's because these are things that are um, more advanced, they're more advanced things to think about when you're talking about um, literature. 
versus this row right here are things that must be necessary when you're analyzing literature. You need to talk about setting, character, point of view, and the plot. I mean, those are the basic elements. And you can see that I kind of put um, author's intent is setting and point of view on that side, and then reader's perception is character and plot. Uh, those aren't necessarily that way. You could rearrange those, and this is, in my brain, this is how I think about it. And then the ones at the bottom sort of are supports um, for those things. Um, as you can see, tone and mood are connected. That's because um, tone and mood sort of bounce between intent and perception, and we'll get to that. But how this is sort of going to work is um, I'm going to just pick things to talk about as we're reading through the passage, starting with the order that I would say is most important for when you're analyzing a piece of literature. Okay, so that all being said, today we're going to look at setting. I think that setting is the most important thing when you're first starting your analysis because it's when you can easily check or uncheck. Um, so it's going to act like a character in of itself. So if nothing else, if you're like, oh my gosh, I don't understand the characters, I don't understand the plot, you can just talk about the setting because the setting is going to act like a character and it's going to mirror the plot. Um, there's something about the setting that's going to be ironic or symbolic in some way and it's going to set the mood of the overall text. So it's the most important thing to understand right away and you can kind of ask yourself these questions. So is it significant? If you're in an AP literature class, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> if you're reading a work that, uh, you know, is maybe um, just some other novel, I can't really speak to that. I can't say it is. My um, gut feeling is yes, the setting is going to be significant. Um, even if the setting is, there's no, real setting, that's significant. Why did the author choose to not have a significant setting? There must be something of significance there. What does the setting suggest? So if they're putting it in, you know, medieval Europe versus if they're setting it in modern Africa, what does that suggest about maybe the author and what they're trying to convey? So there's gonna be uh, some suggestion there. And then if you remember reading um, How to Read Literature Like a Professor, especially when you get to older writers, what's going on with the physical world? Not just the setting significance, but the physical world. What's the weather like? Is it rainy all the time? That's probably gonna be important. Is it mountainous? Is it cavernous? Is it a desert? What's going on? Is it a beautiful forest? Or is it a, you know, barren, desolate wasteland, it's gonna be important. And then juxtapose settings. So is there a setting that is presented first and then they present a second setting and contrast them? Or is there a goal to reach an end setting and maybe there's a journey? So think about, is there a juxtaposition between the settings? So this is why I say think about care, uh, setting first because it's probably gonna be the most significant thing in that it's going to either drive or mirror the plot um, or it's going to act like its own character in some way. And at the very least, it's going to set a mood. It's going to set sort of an atmosphere. So let's go ahead and start reading Araby. Um, one thing to kind of think about, if we're going to go back a little and think about um, James Joyce. If you know nothing else about James Joyce, you should know he's Irish. We've talked at length before about what it means, uh, what your nationality might mean about the type of writing that you're doing, but specifically the Irish, there's going to be a really important cultural history here. The Irish were colonized by the British and subjugated um, by the British Empire for a long time. And um, we usually think of the British Empire colonizing in terms of, um, you know, Africa, Asia, the Americas but they didn't start there. You know, they started closer to home, colonizing the Welsh, the Scottish, and the Irish, um, the Gaelic peoples, the Celtic peoples. And so when the Irish were forced to give up their traditional ways, to give up their language, to give up their land, um, there's a lot of resentment. 
towards English in general, the English and the language. And there's a tension inherent in an Irish writer writing in English. And also that James Joyce is writing in the, um, in the time period where he's sort of trying to figure out what it means to have an Irish identity, especially um, in modernization where there's a push away from religion. And so while traditionally the Irish would have been um, Roman Catholic and the British um, more of a Christian, uh, base, base, which you might think is not that much of a difference, but it is. It is, and it meant a lot culturally. And so these ties between what it means to be Irish and Catholic, and then what it means to be Irish but not Catholic, or um, what it means to be Irish but also a, a British citizen or not a British citizen, there's a lot of these tensions. And so James Joyce being Irish means there's already going to be some cultural implications and cultural tensions in the work itself. And James Joyce writes pretty much exclusively in Dublin. And so just if you ever see Joyce, if you ever see passages by Joyce or novels by Joyce, keep in mind he's Irish and keep in mind those tensions when you talk about Irish cultural um, heritage and literature. Second note about setting. Um, in the term Araby, a uh, very outdated term. You would never use this today. It's sort of a catch-all term used to refer to the Arab world. Um, here being used to just reference some abstract Arabic place, um, really meaning somewhere in the Middle East or um, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, but it's sort of like the other right? It's exotic. It's foreign. It's not from here. So let's look at setting. North Richmond Street, being blind, was a quiet street except at the hour when the Christian Brothers School set the boys free. An uninhabited house of two stories stood at the blind end detached from its neighbors in a square ground. The other houses of the street, conscious of decent lives within them, gazed at one another with brown, imperturbable faces. The former tenant of our house, the priest, had died in the back drawing room. Air, musty from having been long enclosed, hung in all the rooms, and the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old, useless papers. Among these, I found a few paper-covered books, the pages of which were curled and damp. The Abbot by Walter Scott, the devout communicant, and the members of Vidot. I liked the last best because its leaves were yellow. The wild garden behind the house contained a central apple tree and a few straggling bushes, under one of which I found the late tenant's rusty bicycle pump. Just stand like a just normal, you know, maybe, you know, Dublin area street. Of course not, it's James Joyce. Everything's gonna have lots of meaning here. But of course we get some setting, like straightforward setting. Where are we? We're in North Richmond Street. Of course, if we were more familiar with the area, we might know where that is, but it's in Ireland. Um, he says it's being blind, which actually just means it's a dead end. But you might get the double entendre here of blindness, meaning um, not able to see the truth or, or almost like disguised, hiding something, hiding an intention. It was a quiet street, except for one particular hour when the Christian boys' school set the boys free. So we know that this is a place which um, is it has a neighborhood school, a religious Christian school. And very interesting word choice here, set the boys free. He could just say when school let out, but he doesn't. He says set the boys free. Sort of meaning free from school, free from their duty, being able free to go about their way, but also free from religion, free from doctrine, being free to do whatever they want. So we're getting hints of setting here and also kind of getting what is the atmosphere of this whole place? There was an uninhibited, uninhabited house, so there's abandoned houses of two stories that stood at the end, detached from its neighbors. So the end of this dead-end street is a house where no one lives, detached from its neighbors almost introducing sort of an eerie feeling. 
the other's house on the street were conscious. The, the houses themselves were conscious of the lives within them. It's very interesting. It's almost like um, the city and the streets themselves are alive. And I think that Joyce is sort of there, but what is the life that's there? Is it a happy, joyous life? I don't think so. It's uninhabited. It's at the blind end. Um, they gaze on one another with brown, on imperturbable faces. They're kind of scowling. They're, they're unmovable. They're, they're not full of life. They're just there. They're just present. What is he saying about the people that live there? Of course, the former tenant of their house was a priest, and he had died in the house. He had died in the back room. If that's not important for setting, I don't know what is. They live in a house where a priest has died. So obviously you get that other, um, you know, sort of nudge at religion, perhaps, um, <laughs> that if the priest has died there, maybe, maybe religion itself is dying there. Maybe there's something about the soul dying. I don't know. I won't go that far. James Joyce probably wants us to. The air itself is musty. It hangs in all the rooms. And the waste room behind was littered with useless papers. So it's just like kind of just littered with stuff. Um, and among this litter that he finds in the room, he finds a bunch of books. So it's interesting that in this setting, books are just littered about. They're not, you know, put in a place of pride. They're not in a bookcase. They're just kind of scattered. What does that tell us about how much they value literature or, or reading or education? You know, what, 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 are we, what are we learning here? Among these books, he finds a few. And of course, <laughs> these, you know, these aren't just random books. These are allusions to, to books that he, he's using on purpose. Um, the Abbot is a book about Mary, Queen of Scots, who is very famous for her almost, uh, her raunchy lifestyle, um, being a little bit uh, a devious in ways, um, but still trying to maintain the facade of royalty. Um, the devout communicant is about being a pious, very religious, devout person. Uh, and then the memoirs is um, a story about actually a police officer who uses his knowledge um, to actually commit crimes and he hides them. He's very deceitful and hides his real identity and his real truth about himself. So, you know, you have these books about um, the, the abbot and the memoirs are, are about being deceitful and hiding your true intentions and your sexual desires and your criminal behaviors. And then the devout communicant is in between that. And it's about being pious and holy and religious. Uh, and so we can kind of tell what he's doing here with the setting is, you know, people are hiding a lot of their true nature under this guise, this, this hidden disguise here. Um, and then he tells us there's a wild garden behind the house which of course contains an apple tree. It's a little on the nose. Um, an apple tree, if you see an apple tree in literature, you should pretty much always think, what's the most important apple? Um, this is, you know, the Garden of Eden. Um, the apple that Eve eats, it's the fall of man, right? So there's an apple tree in the middle and then a few straggling bushes kind of crowded around it. I mean, this is pretty, pretty obvious imagery here. You know, you have that the apple tree that signifies, you know, this religious purpose, and then around it is just straggling bushes. There's just, you know, that's it. Under which of them he, found a, he finds a rusty bicycle pump. So, you know, you have that apple tree, that representation of religion, and Eve, the gathering of knowledge, but also the fall of man. And then around it is just bushes not being taken care of, and underneath it he finds a rusty bicycle pump, just abandoned. So we're kind of seeing this duality of the setting here. Remember what I said, think about juxtaposition. How is it being um, mirrored with each other? Here's the last little section we're gonna read. So remember that they live in the house of a priest. He had been a very charitable priest. In his will, he had left all of his money to institutions and the furniture of his house to his sister. When the short days of winter came, dusk fell before we had well eaten our dinners. When we met in the street, the houses had grown somber. The space of sky above us was the color of ever-changing violet, and towards it the lamps of the street lifted their feeble lanterns. The cold air stung us, and we played till our bodies glowed. Our shouts echoed in the silent street. 
The career of our play brought us through the dark, muddy lanes behind the houses where we ran the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages to the back doors of the dark, dripping gardens where odors arose from the ash pits to the dark, odorous stables where a coachman soothed and combed the horse or shook music from the buckled harness. This one's a lot more clear here. Look at the imagery. You have these short days of winter. Um, the houses themselves are growing somber. The sky is ever-changing violet. It's this deep purple. It's not a bright, brilliant day. It's becoming nighttime and it's darkening. The lamps of the street lift their feeble lanterns, their weak lanterns. The cold air stings, but they played until their bodies glowed. So even though the atmosphere around them is stinging and somber and feeble, the kids are still finding a way to make their bodies glow. They're playing still, they're shouting, they're having fun, even in the silence of the street. They're going through the dark, muddy lanes, they run the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages. They go to the dark, dripping uh, gardens where the odors arise. The odorous um, stables, the dark, odorous stables. You know, so there's pretty much everything around them is darkness. It's, it's dark. It's eerie. It's, um, it smells. It's dripping. Think about that. If this setting is a character, I mean, this is like the villain. It's almost like the setting itself is the villain. And it's sort of mirroring the plot here because... The world is dark. The world is very dark. But the kids don't see that. You know, they are playing until their bodies glow. They, the narrator hasn't told us here, I hate my life, I hate where I live. He's just describing it as it is. And we, the reader, understand that the setting is sinister and dark. But we get these, you know, these little nuggets of a, of a character telling us that he has not, at this point in the story, he has not been corrupted by the world. He finds those books and he's like, I liked the one with yellow pages best. You know, that brightness, the body's glowing. In the middle of this darkness, there's still that brightness. So at the beginning of this story, the setting is really important because the setting is telling us how much the significance of the world is affecting these, this, this kid as of right now. What does it suggest about, about what might happen later? Well, it's probably there's going to be a shift somewhere. Either the setting's going to shift, the character's going to shift. Something has to change and something has to evolve. Because otherwise, we're just getting a diary. And what we really want is a story, remember? So, um, oops, I'm jumping ahead here. So this setting, there's something about the author's intent here about what's gonna happen with the setting. And that's what we want to see is how is the setting um, contributing to the overall text? So think about those, think about the word choice used to describe it. Think about the mood that it's setting. Um, does it provide that contrast, that juxtaposition? So that's where we're gonna stop for today. Um, and then we will come back um, next time with character.